I, was, I started by looking at the Declaration on Universal Norms on Bioethics, which you all have at the back of your book. And what I want to say is, when we look at that very carefully, there are three points which I will speak to this morning, which have already been said by other speakers. Number one, there is an assumption of a rights-based framework. Number two, there is an assumption also of universal goods. And three, I'll talk very briefly about the political situation in the Pacific countries today, which I think we accepted everything which came down from the West, unthinkingly, we just picked it up and went with it, to a questioning now to an outright challenging. So there are the three sort of points I'll talk to very quickly. I'm going to... Okay, number one, what do we mean by rights? This was already discussed this morning. Um, ethical guidelines, as we have seen, have a tradition of being rights-based, to advocate the rights of individual research participants and operate, operate on the assumption that individual rights are paramount. But working within a Pacific framework, the focus shifts from individual rights and the emphasis is given instead to both the group and interpersonal relationships. This does not negate individual rights, rather it recognises the limits of the individual rights based approach for people who have a relational theory of personhood. And that is the, the concept I'll be using for the Pacific, a regional theory of personhood. I'm very sorry that Ella Hamids is not going to be presenting. She was going to present for us on the um, a Maori perspective of, of informal consent. But right here I could give you two very quick examples of the hollowness, if you like, of an informal consent process. For example, in New Zealand at the time, at the moment, there is that hot, there is a big argument on DNA. Me giving my blood so you can um, take identify the DNA in terms of migration processes and those sorts of things. There's quite a large debate. I won't go into it. So on the one hand, you get my informed consent to give you my blood. But on the other hand, if by giving you my blood, I'm not really just telling you about me, am I? I'm telling you about the whole of my people, my history, all those sorts of things. So there is the I, the, the thou, which is implicit in a, a debate on informed consent. And they are the sorts of things which Pacific Islanders know in New Zealand, not so much in the Pacific, but we're catching on a bit better. That's what they're on about. Can I use another example of informed consent? Um, I might have the title of a book wrong, but this is the sort of thing why we actually need policies in the Pacific, is that increasingly researchers from other parts of the world who cannot conduct the research they want to conduct in their countries are coming to Pacific countries because we do not have such good policies. And there is an example of someone in the Cook Islands going in fairly recently and he fell off his motorbike and went to the hospital for some blood. And then while he was there, uh, he sort of asked all the people in the ward I'm, I'm just telling this very generally, asked the people in the ward if he could collect their blood as well, which he did. <laughs> and then he analysed the blood in terms of DNA and found ten, nine um, compatibilities out of ten, but really uh, there's a lot of issues in there. Okay, so there's the rights. There is a tension in the rights. Knowledge, if we look at universals or uh, frameworks, every Pacific society has a framework of knowledge that is systematically gathered and formulated within, within a paradigm of general truths and principles. Knowledge gathering, systems of validating knowledge and legitimizing information are processes that are often determined and regulated by a select group within the tradi traditional hierarchy. In Pacific societies, knowledge is to protect and enhance the quality of life or the well-being of people. And can I go back to the previous discussion? When we're talking about the well-being of people, we're not talking about their health well-being, their economic well-being. In the Pacific way, the well-being refers to the people who have gone before, the present, and the future. It ref refers to economic, social, environmental. It refers to the whole lot. It's in a, a very holistic framework. Within that framework, we can distinguish between knowledge that is protected and sacred and knowledge that is owned and shared by the community. But ownership of knowledge is both familial and collective because knowledge centred on the continuation of the reciprocal relationships is an interactive and a dynamic process. So ethical principles are central to the way knowledge is utilised and built. Ethical principles facilitate and nurture those. So the challenge for the Pacific countries in this next course of time, I guess, is to 
frame and ethics discourse and systems which are Pacific in philosophy and locally grounded in context so that we can shape the new generation of research and researchers. And it, uh, someone asked a question about NGOs before. The process, the process of this formation of knowledge must be community-based, understood and agreed to. It is, there is no point at all in putting forward laws and those sorts of things when, um, how are we going for time? I'm not going to win the prize for time. Okay, if we look at political, I've already said that the countries in the Pacific tend to accept a lot of universal declarations with little, little real consideration or little grassroots, if you like, consultation on these. Sometimes they agree with the principle, sometimes there's donor push, sometimes there's envisaged political and economic gains, but hopefully overall there is a genuine wish to recognise the existence of universal ideas of what is good, equitable, just and good quality of life. But at the same time we know that are these global conventions understood by whom, agreed to by whom, or are they followed? And then there is the tension between the community understood rules and legislation. Do we start at the top with the legislation? Do we start at the community? Or do we go together? Just a very quick word on the political scene, as you probably know, uh, the context in the Pacific at the moment is a time of increasing economic, social and political and cultural unrest. We have the Fijian coups, we have the coups in the Solomons in Tonga at the moment. We have uh, a Tongan um, people who are not overthrowing the monarchy but questioning democracy, um, starting with economic principles of poverty related principles but then going to democratic. So really, for anything that we go, relevance to the Pacific context is very important. I could give you the case of Samoa, where just recently the International Parliamentary Union, which is like a guiding ethical body, if you like, for parliaments all around the world, just this year there was a case where um, a member of the opposition took his case to the International Parliamentary Union because he did not think that the Speaker of the House and the uh, Prime Minister were, act were acting ethically in the way they conducted Parliament. And so the Parliamentary Union sent down a team to Samoa to investigate these complaints and unfortunately it was two women, as you will find out later why I say that is unfortunate. When the report came through, which just which said that the uh, the leader of the opposition had been correct, um, last week in Samoa that was the report was thrown out, and it was said the grounds for it are many. I won't go into them, but one of them was what right does an outside institution have to come into a, a country and set these policies? Um, the bit unfortunate about the women was that they said they were a couple of old ladies who uh, who didn't know much at all. So I, I think there should have been a male on that party, and that would have. Uh, that's just something by the by. So this is what is happening in the Pacific in terms of politics, in terms of the po political um, acceptance of these overarching universal declarations. So why today is it necessary a belief in norms and guiding standards that is developing? We do have a contri contribution to make to global research community and also protection against outside researchers coming in and doing their research in our countries unethically, including pharmaceutical companies. What are our starting points? When I was preparing this paper, it was quite astounding to me to realise that in the Pacific I could find lots of community examples of groups who were very active in developing ethical policies. For example, I won't talk about them today, but JAWS, the, Journalism, the Journalists Association of Western Samoa, the Vanuatu Cultural Centre, a Pacific platform of action which is women. But while we have all these good starting points, there were no universities with eth ethics research policies, not at all. And that was quite astounding. When I looked at the universities, they had policies on, you know, if you go into a country, you must make sure you contact and get a right to do research. Um, you will get money for research and that sort of thing. But there's no ethical policies. But partnerships are developing. So the UNESCO platform for the next um, biennium was our meeting earlier here in Bangkok this meeting here today. And then in February in New Zealand, there is an Ethics of Knowledge Production Conference, February for the 14th, at the New Zealand National Commission. And one of the reasons why we were so active in getting a Pacific group to this meeting was that will be the resource group for the next two years. I'll put some flyers out for that meeting for those who are interested. 
What will our strategy be? It must be community-based dialogue, action and public dialogue. It will also be partnerships. Uh, just the two days, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday before I came to this meeting in Samoa, we had a health health rights research conference where about 150 health people from New Zealand, ranging from police through research, through practical um, people, they came to Samoa and they talked about their, their ethical papers, if you like, amongst other things. And the Health and Disabilities Commissioner was also there. And the interesting thing was that they came with what they knew and the local nurses and doctors and surgeons and and we discussed and we found that there were meeting points where we could share what they were doing and hopefully learn from them and adapt to our, to our situation. But that's, that's where I see um, UNESCO going in the next couple of years in, in our Pacific program, universities. And um, I just draw your attention to the International Council for the Study of the Pacific Islands, IPSCI, which is based in Apia, and they, they will be one of our drivers. They are, at the next meeting in October, going to strive to get um, ethics policies into universities. Just for your information very quickly, and it follows what has already been said this morning, I have just copied here from New Zealand, from um, Health Research Committee. These are the guiding principles for forming, maintaining ethical research relations for Pacific Research in New Zealand, and these were the uh, things that they announced. That these were the um, principles that they came up with, and then when they did a cross check with uh, sort of what you'd call universal principles, many of them are pretty much the same, aren't they? Except that they have been arrived at through dialogue within the community themselves. Uh, relationships. So there's your individual group. Respect, cultural competency, meaningful engagement, I'm not a good reader, reciprocity, utility, rights, balance, protection, capacity building and participation. So to complete, what we have at the moment in the Pacific and in some of the countries which have spoken already this morning, we've got the collision, if you like, of two different paradigms. An interface between Western social science practice and an approach that reflects what they have called the conventions of fine Pacific oratory. There is a consistent negotiation of two very different approaches to understanding the world that we live in. And this is reflexive of today's contemporary and complex Pacific realities. We are not saying that we throw out everything which is coming in. What we are saying is that we are familiar with it, we talk about it, and we make our own decisions on that. Thank you. Okay, do we have uh, any questions, comments? Uh, yes, Justin, please. Um. Uh, just arrived from London. I think just a general comment. It's uh, interesting. Um, you're saying that there are a, a very different concept on uh, on informed consent um, in the indigenous population. Um, and this is something that I think obviously will emerge from the conference from various uh, people here with, uh, from different backgrounds and countries and cultures. Um, as a general um, comment on the International Convention and view of uh, uh, the latest theories in politics, you must have uh, heard of uh, a substantive book by Negri called The Empire, where there's a lot of discussion going on, that we are now moving into a world where there is a sort of a UN-led conventions uh, becoming the norms across the world and cultures and individuals and there is a sort of imperialism without the imperialist that these conventions are the new imperialism of the world. <coughs> and, and there is a lot of concern about this, this trend and, I, and since you are representing UNESCO I wonder with this example we wouldn't, shouldn't be moving towards a convention of bioethics systems rather than an international convention of instruments to avoid such a so it's a catastrophe in the future. Thank you. It is, sorry, I, I haven't worked for UNESCO for long, but it is something which really has to be considered. And the Pacific are starting to uh, to review and evaluate international conventions. The example I was going to use was the CEDAW, the Convention of the Rights of the, uh, the Child as well, that 
Pacific countries are starting to adapt those key principles to their Pacific situation, not just accept them wholeheartedly as we would have in the past. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Ivo Kwan from South Korea, and I have two questions. I wonder, the, in this rapid change and in the industrial industrialized world, is it possible to uh, preserve the Pacific Island culture? It's first question. And the second one is, if so, is it justifiable on what basis? And uh, uh, I, I feel some contradiction between the group informed consent and the individual informed consent. It's a very clear contradiction, I think. But uh, we just yeah, evaluate and consider the cultural diversity and many groups, many minority groups' cultural diversity. But I think it is hardly possible in such a world like it is. That's my question. Thank you. Yes, that is right. There are considerable tensions. But on the other hand, I think countries like the presenters who have presented, was it the Wings model uh, before, and the Pacific uh, relational concepts, if you like, of research, offer alternatives which other countries in the world should be considering. And we should, if we can, stand firm on those ones which are doable. I guess that that's all I can say really, given the extensive migration and you know, the whole global community thing, but to recognise that there are different, that at some time and place there were different values, and for many peoples in the world those values are still observed and still meaningful in everyday life. And if we want to protect our humanness, if you like, then uh, that's what we should strive to aim for rather than uh, economic gains. Sorry. Uh, Ken Daniels from New Zealand. Uh, thank you, Peggy, for uh, a very helpful presentation, uh, especially given the way in which it linked in with the uh, earlier presentations. The, the question that I'd like to ask you to um, explore a little bit, I guess, is that given what some people would talk about as the traditional paternalism that has been present in many Pacific nations, what's the implications of that in terms of moving towards the kind of policies and approaches that uh, you are outlining? I guess I am talking in ideals, but I'm talking in ideals which are very real in the Pacific and practiced in the Pacific right now. But as you say, as Pacific Islanders migrate and watch a lot of TV and are educated, there are great changes. Um, that question I wish I could answer. It, it is the eternal question. and. Just to finish on, to sort of go back to, to that, I, I came with me, I brought with me, but I cannot find it now. There was a huge debate in the New Zealand newspapers, I found, about um, a group of academics, I think, in the Auckland University who were jumping up and down about their DNA research. And some professor of philosophy uh, labelled them what he called the sham tohangas, who were holding on to the past and just not recognising change. And in supporting his words, he referred to uh, to Rani Hidoro, Sir Peter Buck, who was writing in the Vikings of the, sun, the Sunrise in the early 1930s. And the thing we have to keep in mind is that the old world created by our Polynes Polynesian ancestors has passed away, and a new world is in the process of being fashioned. But at the same time, I do not really see why we cannot fashion the new world according to these values of, which are really values of human beings, aren't they? Of quality of life and respect for all. Um, hopefully these sorts of research principles may be taken on by a new group of researchers who may come to different conclusions about strategies and processes that we could be following, which might run parallel to what I would call pure research of um, 
Well, now I'm getting into bad territory, so I'll leave that one. Thank you. Okay, well, th th thank you very much, Peggy. Very interesting and stimulating. I'd like uh, the next uh, uh, presentation, just while uh, John Maru is coming up. On the question of Pacific culture and paternalism, I think it's a common question across the whole region and, in fact, across the globe. And the UNESCO Universal Declaration of Bioethics is based upon a principled approach to bioethics, but also emphasizes that it's important to have um, the freedom of discussion and different systems. So I think as we try to implement, we're very free to use a relationship-based models and other based models of uh, how bioethics actually works and how it will work. Um, so, uh, John Ru Yun, please, will present on with the LC program in Korea. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the applause <laughs> in advance. <laughs> um, I'm a sociologist by training, so I'm a mundane social scientist, and I'm going to talk about the contemporary situation in Korea, and I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, my contemplation on how to proce how to proceed. Uh, I mean, how to uh, promote the principle of bioethics, the uh, value of bioethics in the context of rapid technological advancement in. Korea. Uh, I have been serving as the principal investigator of the so-called ELSI program in Korea since uh, 2001. So it has been almost uh, it has been almost four years. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the background and the uh, changes in circumstances and the future direction of the ELSI or bioethics program in Korea. Okay, uh, faced with the rising uh, bioethics related controversies in Korea, uh, in the year of 2000, the Korean government, the Ministry of Science and Technology decided to include, decided to include the ELSI pro program uh, in their RFP of long term 10 year research funding for biotechnology. Uh, I mean, uh, specifically, the the first one was the uh, project on human genomics, the functional analysis of human genome. And the inclusion of the ERSI program was modeled after the human genome project in the United States. So that was the beginning of the ERSI program, and I was invited to lead that interdisciplinary uh, program since then. In Korea, there have been uh, controversies uh, on GMOs in the late 1990s, and uh, there, ha there, were, there has been controversies on human cloning since the, uh, the famous Dolly and the success of transgenic uh, tra uh, the, uh, cloning of uh, cows in Korea in the uh, late 1990s. And also, there have been very, uh, I mean, hard controversies on human stem cell research uh, in, uh, in, a com in, a co uh, in accordance with the advancement in, advancement in uh, human uh, embryonic stem cell research in Korea. And also, there have been, uh, there were controversies on uh, human genomic database, uh, whether it would, uh, whether it was appropriate to collect and utilize the human genomic uh, database or uh, gene, uh, what is it, human gen genomic data bank uh, for forensic purpose and the, for the humanistic cause of locating the missing children. And that effort uh, was aborted by the opposition of NGO groups at that time, and GMOs became, uh, uh, I mean, the labeling for GMO products uh, were, const uh, were uh, instituted in the uh, late 1990s. However, recently there have been very uh, significant shifts in circumstances. 
Uh, and I would mention three uh, changes. First one was the legislation of Bioethics and Biosafety Act effective as of January 1st, uh, the year of 2000. When I started the ERSI program, there was no regulatory uh, legal framework uh, in Korea regulating the research on uh, biotechnology. However, with the uh, legislation of the law uh, and the appointment of National Bioethics Committee this year, um, the basic, uh, the fundamental regulatory framework has been instituted and the remaining tasks have been, uh, became the refinement and implementation of regulations and guidelines. That are the tasks to be left and to be accomplished in the future. And also, the IRBs, uh, the IRB practice was very new uh, in the late 1990s, but IRBs have been instituted at most, uh, I mean, research-oriented hospitals. And also, some IRBs have been registered for US IRB organization. The next one. Uh, the most important uh, shift in the circ circumstances are the publication of Dr. Fang Wu-seok in science in the year of 2004 and this year consecutively. Well, uh, he has been considered as one of the most uh, famous um, scientists in the human stem cell research area. And uh, with uh, his publications in uh, the academic journal Science, I mean, uh, in the science, uh, scientific journal Science, there have been enthusiastic support for stem cell research in Korea on the part of the uh, I mean, policy makers and also the general public as well. According to a recent, recent poll conducted uh, this past July, over 66% of Koreans are in favor of the rapid advancement in human stem cell research and the medical application of the research research. Okay, and these days, I mean, this, uh, the, uh, at the moment, uh, not strong voices against the human stem cell research are heard in public discussion, in public, uh, I mean, the newspapers and on, uh, and uh, the um, mass media is really, uh, I mean, they are really enthusiastic in uh, releasing any news related to human, uh, related to the so-called, I mean, the quote-unquote success of Dr. Huang's research. Okay. And uh, the other, um, another, uh, I mean, uh, changes are related to the rapid advancement and convergence in technology of uh, information technology and biotechnology and nanotechnology and robotics too. Uh, and the result is the widening information gap between expert and lay citizens. And in this respect, I don't think uh, ELSI specialist or bioethicist could be included in the uh, group of technological expert in this area. It, it has become more difficult, I have to admit, to follow the technological advancement and the new information in, uh, related to the converging and more complicated technology. And uh, think, I mean, uh, the conce uh, to conceptualize the human, uh, social, uh, social and legal implications of those complicated technology have become more and more difficult, I think I have to admit. Okay. So, at the moment, uh, I think the ELSI programs or bioethics in Korea are at the juncture of assessing the past accomplishment 
and uh, the future, I mean, strategizing the future direction of our uh, research and activities in various um, fields. The first issue to be considered is whether to pursue the macro level generic, I mean, general uh, concerns or micro level specific concerns. I think we have to, uh, uh, we have to, you know, decide on the, uh, what is the focus or the weight, the, uh, the comparative weight between those two uh, areas. And, uh, but more complicated thing is that the old concerns have not been resolved, but it have become, I mean, they have become further complicated in new technology, uh, to name a few, uh, individual autonomy and social justice and uh, many other issues. In this situation, uh, I mean, what do I have to do as a principal investigator of the research program? I think uh, uh, it has some. Uh, it has. Re it is related to who would be the audience of my research, and who would be the audience, or who should be the audience of my research. I think it's the matter of the audience, and uh, the choice of audience is directly related to the, mission, the fundamental question of ELSI program. What is the mission of the bioethics and ELSI program? Is it, uh, some, someone uh, criticized that e the bioethics in general and uh, ELSI program modeled after the uh, ELSI program in the United States uh, uh, is, uh, could be a co-optation co -optation for uh, the research in biotechnology. Uh, but uh, my, uh, the next, next, next one please. So what is the mission of ERSI and bioethics program? I think that is the precaution. It is a precaution. But still, I have to figure out Precaution for what? And preca especially precaution by whom? Precaution by whom? Who would be, who should be responsible for that precaution? And who would be most effective for that precaution to be implemented in practice? I think that's the practical question of the bioethics program. And uh, I have not made up my mind, uh, my decision for me yet, but uh, my hunch is that education, uh, communication, and education has become and is going to become more and more important in bioethics and ELSI program. And Daryl this morning talked about informed citizenship and uh, my argument would be that scientists and policy makers are uh, um, parts of informed citizens. And what I have found so far is that uh, scientists and policy makers uh, want to be uh, want to be a responsible, informed citizens. But they do. Uh, they are not good at. They and they are not. I mean, they are aware that. There are some ethical and legal and social dimensions involved in biotechnology. Uh, however, they do not know how to be, how to implement that awareness. So I think we have to push more for the communication, uh, dissemination of information, and communication and education of all those groups, including those uh, in charge of making policy and uh, conducting research. That is my, uh, uh, that is my, I mean, uh, thought at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. I'm Amir from Pakistan. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Your South Korea certainly led the way in uh, stem cell research and um, as biotechnology has uh, uh, gone along in this roller coaster ride and, bio and bioethics has followed in, the, in this uh, uh, ride and you're following. Um, you, you mentioned in one of your slides that uh, um, there is a gap uh, between uh, what the scientists now know and what the lay people know about this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, please do correct me if I if misunderstood this. But uh, uh, I believe that uh, the gap is actually narrowing, not widening, with uh, so much information now coming on with the internet and newspapers, etc., and the lay press also. Every day you have uh, uh, headlines, etc., uh, not only in your uh, uh, scientific journals, but also in the lay press, um, uh, breakthrough in, in stem cell research, um, embryo cloned, uh, animal cloned, the dog cloned, etc. So the na uh, the gap is actually narrowing mm -hmm. rather than widening, mm -hmm. uh, and people, the lay people, uh, etc., are also finding more and more uh, about uh, stem cell research. Uh, does it not make it easier for the scientific community? to explain things uh, uh, to the uh, people rather than more difficult? Oh, thank you. You know, the thing is that, I mean, people are, uh, I mean, get in touch, uh, people get in touch with more and more information on the uh, success of sci uh, scientific and technological research. But I don't think that uh, necessarily implies that uh, people are more and more informed of the implications of those uh, technical success in their own life and in especially in the uh, I mean in the lives of future generation Yes, I'm Miyako Takagi and come from Japan, the uh, Nihon University. Um, the, as you mentioned, you, in your uh, Korean research group uh, succeed in uh, ESL from the human cloning mm -hmm. cells. And, uh, but I, I, I'm wondering uh, the, 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 the Korean woman, the lot of, uh, the, the lot of Korean young women donate mm -hmm. the eggs mm -hmm. and uh, without any money, even in money for the transportation, uh, when, uh, when I read in a Japanese journal. And uh, in Japan, is, uh, it is uh, quite impossible to donate egg without anything and uh, just for the research purpose. And so I would like to know the, how the Korean young woman is thinking for the egg donation for the research purpose. Uh, okay, thank you very much for that question. I think the major accomplishment of bioethics group and NGOs in Korea over the past uh, maybe decades is that at least, I mean, scientists and policy makers, uh, I mean, got to be aware that some kind of uh, ethical involvement or procedural justice have been involved in the uh, conduct of the research. And actually, uh, I'm not sure, I mean, here is uh, Dr. So, uh, Dr. Song, and doc, uh, Dr. Kwon is going to talk more about uh, the current state of stem cell research in Korea. Well, uh, I understand that uh, Dr. Song sent a letter to the Journal of Science in 2004, uh, criticizing the ethical uh, procedure, I mean, proce uh, et uh, ethical procedure involved in Dr. Huang's research. But as far as I know, for his research, for the publication in uh, 2005, uh, IRBs uh, were instituted and the informed consent were uh, conducted in proper manner. And what I heard from my friend is that many Korean young women uh, are really or really have been willing to donate the, the human I mean, their eggs, even uh, with being informed uh, of the health risks involved. 
they volunteered to uh, donate the eggs. So the uh, I mean uh, the ethics team uh, involved in that research had to disorient many women not to donate uh, their eggs. So they had to select. <laughs> so I think it is some kind of maybe some kind of cultural difference. We had to, uh, we have to, uh, uh, we have to conduct more research into that kind of, uh, you know, practice of citizens in Korea. So there, there must be other values involved in addition to uh, the health, individual health risks. So that is the matter of maybe cultural difference or ideological, or something ideological or whatever. It's different value. Okay, well, I think we have to move on to the next paper. Thank you very much, John Ru, for interesting talk. So this uh, spirit of giving to society. Um, reflected in many ways. Uh, the last uh, uh, paper before lunch is uh, uh, Dr. Ganan Gidani from Iran who talk on Islamic medical codes and he just arrived off an airplane so I hope you're feeling well. Um, in Allah and the righteous deaths and then join one another to believe in the throat and then join one another to be patient and uh, steadfast in Allah's path against the uh, disbelievers. Islam relies on fully uh, enlightened hearts and the insights of individual Muslims, provides guidelines for personal lives of its followers, such as uh, other uh, religions. Uh, all of the, my belief is uh, all of religions is the same about ethics. Has considered various cultural, economic, juridical, and uh, governmental aspects. Exerts a great influence as a rule on all aspects of human life. Morality, uh, conscientious inspi inspirations, which is a force other than reason and emotion, dictating inwardly and uh, determining those and don'ts. Moral act is an act that is taken as a duty, which is determined by conscience. Mission of ethics identify uh, various potentials of man and help him attain a balance between various desires of self in order to find the way toward his deserved perfection. The Honorable Prophet of Islam, uh, I ended, was appointed to perfect moral virtues. The Holy Prophet, uh, he who wakes up in the morning and uh, has not had made any effort for his Muslim uh, brethren is not a Muslim. Surah Qalam, uh, another phrase in Holy Quran. And O oh Muhammad, verily uh, you are a man of high level character. Imam Ali, we have uh, 12 Imams, uh, religion, religious leaders in Islam. Imam Ali is the first leader Imam in Islam. Piety is the head of all virtues. The most noble lineage comes from good demeanor. Imam Sajjad, the uh, fourth Imam in Islam, uh, says, uh, and bestow upon me the most eminent virtues. Sadi is the famous poem in Iran. Says uh, human beings are of the same origin, who are similar in creation. When a member becomes ailing, others will become restless because of empathy. 
The moral value of a man's voluntary act depends on the effect of that act in attaining true perfection. The value of every knowledge is dependent upon the honorableness of its subject and ends. The more important the subject and the more sacred the end, the more valuable and significant the knowledge. Medical ethics, my belief is uh, b medical ethics is not separable uh, from uh, ethics in other branches. Uh, but uh, every uh, branch of work uh, has uh, ethics, especially for uh, their work. Medical ethics, the science that concerns uh, with those behaviors and rules that should be observed by all in medical professions. Medical ethics is as uh, inseparable from the world view as is uh, the ethics itself. History of medical ethics. Medical profession has been subject to moral advices and professional regulations. Indian and Egyptian physicians observed ethical uh, precepts. Medical ethics had a substantial importance in ancient Greek civilization. Hammurabi's charter, uh, 20,200 BC. Avesta includes uh, uh, other religion in Iran. Uh, from uh, uh, older years. Avesta includes several provisions and rules about physicians and medicine. Prophet Muhammad, there are two kinds of knowledge. Knowledge of the body, medicine, means medicine, and knowledge of religions. Imam Sadiq, sixth Imam in uh, Islam, no society can do without three things. A pious, knowledgeable scholar, a benevolent, uh, obed chief, and a trusted, insightful physician. Islamic ethical authors, Muhammad Zakaria Razi, uh, is named Razes in all of books. Uh, has a book uh, named uh, The Spiritual Medicine. Abu Ali Sina uh, is the famous uh, physician in, uh, in all of the world. Avi Sina has a book uh, is named uh, On Ethics. Medicine and medical ethics. A spiritual and psychological treatment of the patient is more important than treating his or her bodily pain and illness. Establishing a spiritual link between the patient and God, and God is one of the main duties of a physician, mentioning the point that only God is health giving. Physician responsibilities uh, to God, his or her mentor, and the issue of education and learning, conscience, patient, society. Physicians' duties and responsibilities toward God. Mm, uh, the famous uh, phrase from uh, Jesus Christ is uh, living the treatment of a wounded or ill person is certainly equal to helping the assailant since the assailant wanted to kill or maim uh, that person and the one who has left the wounded has not wanted his betterment. Physicians' duties and responsibilities toward his her mentor and the issue of teaching and learning. A physician, uh, either as a learner or as a teacher, should observe the dignity of knowledge and first of all try to edify and purify him or, or herself and learn and teach in order to comply with God's will. Principles that a physician should be committed to. First of all, must edify him or, her, or her, him, uh, herself and attain a high level of knowledge. Consider practical education more important than oral education. 
should be aware of his or her poor ability and knowledge when compared with God and uh, remain humble. Observe regularity and discipline. Teach like an uh, affectionate and sympathetic father. Observe the principle of graduation and repetition in learning and teaching. Acquaintance with uh, rhetoric and related skills. Courage uh, in accepting reasonable objections. Increasing encouragement to learn and teach and act as a role model. Observe justice and fairness. Remain pious and virtuous. Avoid the uh, notorious and weak company. Physician's responsibility to edify him or herself, uh, being in the, endowed with human virtues and Islamic qualities is necessary for a Muslim physician. Benevolence is so important in medicine that any negligence, omission, deception, or uh, hypocrisy is considered a crime. A real benevolent does not commit treason, is not self-centered, sympathizes with others. Physician and patient, good treatment and compromise, serious in the world to solve the patient's problem, avoiding discrimination between the poor and the wealthy, distinguishing medicine from business, paying attention to the patient and attracting his or her trust, upgrading one's knowledge and skills, trust, worthiness, piety and avoidance of taboos, observing divine limits in giving orders to the patient, observing confidentiality, recommending preventive measures. Physician's social responsibilities. Physician is responsible to the society and government. Physician, while being promised to enjoy spiritual rewards in the world after, should be able to afford his or her uh, reasonable needs through a sufficient salary. Excessive inclination toward financial issues will result in commercialization of medicine and avoiding it from humanity and sacredness and make it a means of amazing wealth and power. Imam Khomeini, uh, past leader of Iran, says you should not uh, taint this profession with material worldly interests or else you will have worked and not blessed by Allah's blessings. Do it your job as a divine profession for God's sake and it's being divine and getting a reward for it are not incompatible. These are not incompatible. The famous uh, phrase in the all of the words, it's it's nice to be important, but it's in, uh, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. <laughs> and final, thank you for your attention. Anna, please, and then Matt. Okay. There's a mic uh, there. Yeah. My question to you: Do you mean to say that? Uh, there are no medical negligences, medical abuses in Iran. If people are going to sincerely follow the medical ethics and uh, Khomeini's uh, uh, narrations, if there are medical cases of medical negligence and medical abuses, is there a law? And uh, do uh, people take the doctors to the courts of law? And uh, if so, how many cases are there? And uh, regarding what medical abuses, if you can throw light upon it, I'll be happy. Thank you. My belief is uh, if uh, every physician works well and uh, visit of patient uh, was uh, good uh, from uh, uh, 
such as um, every physician, if uh, works well, uh, do not necessary to uh, other um, mentions. Uh, medical negligence is separate from ethics. Negligence is two kind. Uh, one kind is uh, scientific negligence uh, is probable for every patient. Uh, physician works well, operate well, operate, and other works well, uh, well do. Uh, but uh, side effects of surgery and drugs uh, is not preventive. But uh, uh, two kind of uh, second kind of negligence is uh, is not scientific. Uh, second kind of negligence is not ethical. Type of one uh, is separated from ethics, but type two is non-ethical. I find your presentation uh, very interesting and I think that you have a very important role to play in the development of your country. Firstly, you are a professional and uh, secondly, you are at the center of the religion of your country. It seems like that uh, you are actually a participant of your religion and not just studying about it. It seems like that uh, you are at uh, uh, the uh, very core of your being. But uh, I'm coming from uh, a Christian uh, background and as one of the, our pastors uh, like to say, for us to remember the meaning of Islam is supposed to be, I shall love all Muslims, uh, irrespective of what Islam means to Muslims, that is supposed to be what Islam means to Christi Christianity. But anyway, uh, what I am interested in, in your country, for example, and in, in Islamic states as a whole, how, d how do you deal with non-Muslims that uh, live in your country? And uh, how, how would you like this thing that you've been talking about, these ethical points and all this? How, uh, how do you deal with the uh, non-Muslims? Do, uh, in the, do you try to convert them or to, to your viewpoints? Or how do you, as a, from your viewpoint as a professional and, then is, and, and, and as a Muslim, how do you view this, uh, this thing? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Muslims and non-Muslims person, people in Iran. Uh, we have uh, in parliament non-Muslims from other religions. Uh, for example, uh, Christian and other religions in parliament. Uh, in hospitals or medicine is not different for house uh, patient was uh, Muslim and non-Muslim. And uh, even uh, we have uh, uh, a surah, is named surah, uh, phrase, uh, famous phrases uh, is named uh, surah Maryam, the mother of uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, we have uh, in Islam uh, uh, wide vision about Muslim and non-Muslim is not different for uh, Islam. Uh, we, uh, we must uh, respect to all of the religions. In Iran is also. But uh, the majority of people in Iran are Muslims. But uh, we have non-Muslims people in Iran. And uh, even uh, we have uh, in parliament non-Muslim um, and is not different for us. Thank you. As I, I'm an engineer, John Buckridge from Australia. And one of the questions I'd like to ask concerns your statement and the statement from the earlier speaker about deception and lying. And uh, somebody said earlier on that under no circumstances should a professional lie. And you have said that the rules of Islam state that deception is forbidden. Now, 
I can see why that might work in things like a structural engineer where you are designing a bridge and if you try and deceive somebody, the bridge might fall down. But if you are a physician, can you think of any circumstances where it would be not only appropriate but morally right to lie? Uh, I don't understand what the doctor say. Well, I'll rephrase it. As a physician, can you see any situation where it is morally correct mm -hmm. not to tell the truth? Uh, if I understand good, uh, I spoke about uh, ethics in medicine. Ethics is a general means but uh, medical ethics is a specialized means of general means. Uh, if patient uh, does not work good for patient, in every situation is not ethical. If uh, his patient work is uh, non-scientific, if scientific, is uh, ethical uh, side effects uh, is uh, um, uh, side effects uh, there are uh, for every uh, uh, medications 